He is the author of The Arabs, A History of the Arabic People, which I'm holding up right here. And we discussed a little bit before beginning with the recording, but how did you end up writing this book about early modern Arab history? I think the genesis of the book came very much out of the political environment in the United States and in Europe in the aftermath of the September 11, 2001 attacks, when suddenly Islam, generally the Arab world in particular, had been cast as an enemy of the West and where the greatest threat to our way of life, our values was perceived to come from the Arab world. And having lived so much of my life in Lebanon, in Egypt, in Jordan, traveled right across the Arab world, I was equally conscious of how for the countries of the Middle East, the reaction of America and its allies came to pose the greatest threat to their values, to their way of life. And I felt that it was important for people in the West to have an opportunity to see modern history through Arab eyes, and that might help them to balance their perspective towards a region in which they were having ever more engagement. So that was the background of the genesis of the book. It is kind of the West's own fault, though, especially as we will get back to later, when they carve up the Ottoman East, it is kind of their own fault and that this they made Islam this enemy of the West in modern times. In a sense, the book looks at the impact of the West on the Ottoman Arab world as a evolving notion of Western domination over the East. And if you like, after a period describing how the Ottomans come to occupy and integrate the Arab world into their empire, much of the book is really working on the 19th and 20th centuries. And for the 19th century, it really is a history of European domination over the Arab world. So Britain and France were playing the key role. And you just mentioned the carve up of Ottoman territories during World War I, in a sense, that's the apotheosis of this process in which Britain and France committed to an industrial era, an industrial order, I'm sorry, an imperial order, had um, seen it natural without consulting with the peoples involved or securing their consent to divide territories and share them between themselves, creating a nation state system out of the former Ottoman imperial order. And then we have the beginning of really the imperial age in the Middle East, which was so influential. And you start with the Selim the first conquest of Egypt, and which was a disaster for the Mamluks. So let's start there in this episode as well. So how, how what did this mean for the Ottoman Empire and the conquest of Egypt? Well, as I say in the opening chapter, the idea of conquering the Mamluk Empire was almost an afterthought for the Ottomans whose primary target at that moment had actually been the Persian Empire. And as they moved across Anatolia or Asia Minor, heading towards the front with Persia, the Ottomans were concerned that they might have exposed their rear to an attack by the Mamluks. They take pause, they take stock of Mamluk strength, and they decide instead of going to Persia, perhaps this campaign season, to focus on the Eastern Mediterranean. It, it didn't really seem to have been more deliberate than that. The Ottomans were by far the more energetic empire. The Mamluks were beginning to suffer from the weaknesses that come of a, a static and old empire. They were wedded to old methods of warfare. They were you know, using old systems of imperial management. And so they really didn't have the strength to withstand the drive of the Ottomans. And after losing battles in Marj Dabek, surrendering to Aleppo and Damascus, the Mamluks fall back onto Cairo for one last stand with Selim, uh, Sultan Selim in hot pursuit. And of course, it'll be in 1517 with the defeat of the, uh, the last Mamluk Sultan, Kansu el that you will have uh, you know, the, the, the final conquest of Mamluk lands by the Ottoman forces and the integration of the Arab lands to the Ottoman Empire. I like Salim or not, he is the reason that the Ottomans became a caliphate and can, because for before they could just call, call themselves a sultanate, but he is the reason why they could call themselves a caliphate, right? It's true. And the aftermath of the Mongol sack of Baghdad 
in 1258, when you know, Genghis Khan and his successors swept through the Abbasid Empire and practically eliminated the, uh, the ruling caliphal family. The surviving members of the Abbasids were taken to Cairo, where they were protected by the Mamluks and were able to lend their caliphal legitimacy to the Mamluks, who after that claimed that they were not only sultans, but caliphs. Mm-hmm. And they brought certain relics related to the life of the Prophet Muhammad back to Cairo to reinforce their religious legitimacy as well as their temporal authority. And the Ottomans in 1517, when they conquered the Mamluks, take it all. They take the sovereign authority of the Mamluks, the secular authority, if you like, as well as all the trappings of the caliphate and claim for themselves both titles over all Arab lands. And that would last right until 1918. So really for much of early modern and modern history, the Ottoman Empire was going to be the dominant force shaping the rules and engagement in the Arab provinces. And I, I see that was on YouTube sometimes, since you do watch videos there as well. And there was comments on the Ottoman Empire we, on the video about Ottomans, where they say that they re, re, pretty much was the dark in the age, etc. And they took away the time, kind of like what the British Empire did to India. But you argue in your book that that's not the case. They in, instead of having like a darkening age under Ottoman rule, they have rather a golden age. I've always thought that when people talk about four centuries of backwardness or decline, they're probably missing a lot of dynamics. And the same applies, I think, when Europeans look back on the Middle Ages, medieval history, you, you really have moved away from talking about the Dark Ages. And one's much more interested in what were the areas of creativity and enlightenment, even in the medieval period, certainly, you know, works around uh, theologians, feminist theologians, mysticism, and certainly in music composition, it would be wrong to be talking about the, uh, you know, high Middle Ages as anything other than a dynamic period. Just look at the architecture that emerges through the, the great cathedrals and abbeys that were to decorate all the major cities of Europe. And I think the same is true when you look at the Ottoman Empire. It's almost a nationalist backwards projection of the 20th century of a colonized Arab world looking for someone else to blame for the perception of Arab backwardness or weakness and saying this was a consequence of four centuries of Ottoman rule. It would be to overlook four centuries in which there were fantastic dynamic historical developments and cultural developments Uh, Again, in architecture, in theology, in chronicles, in poetry, that made for quite a distinct period of Arab history, it would be wrong to portray that as a period of imposed backwardness or decline. And I want to bring this, I feel like it's kind of relevant because we were discussing this in our two-part episode on the Ottoman sultans as well, that in Greek, when you you watch, I haven't been there myself, but the guy guy was talking I suggest had and they said that the guys there when they talked about the Ottomans, so they were murdering everyone and they were killing everyone in Greece. But that's not simply the case because if they did, there wouldn't be anyone left. He argues so the, it can't have been just bad and murders of the Greek population as they claim when they talk about Ottoman history. No, but I wouldn't want to whitewash Ottoman history. Right, and I think there were periods of great conflict, great bloodshed. There, there certainly were times where the Ottoman state uh, repressed uprisings in uh, the Balkan territories that gave rise to accusations of massacres. Uh, I, I think that in the Greek War of Independence in the 1820s, there were definitely you know, measures taken by the Ottoman center that horrified people in Greece and in the wider world. And I think that, you know, moving through the 19th century as nationalism came to challenge Ottoman control over territories in the Balkans, in eastern Anatolia, that you had uh, instances of atrocities, crimes against humanity, even genocide. So You do have the infamous Armenian genocide, of course. Which would be the worst case of an attempt to suppress a minority community Uh, that was deemed by the Ottomans to be a threat to their control over their territory. Mm -hmm. And here it remains something that uh, the Turkish government continues to try and suppress, 
but increasingly even Turkish scholars are writing more and more about the history of the genocide. And of course, we have to skip a wee bit here because you do write about a lot and we only have the time to discuss the tip of the iceberg of what you write about in the book, I'm afraid. We can't go word for word, but uh, we have to talk about a little fella, a French fella, who enters Egypt called Napoleon. So how does this change the course for the Ottoman Empire and for Napo the French and eventually what would be European dominance in the Middle East? It's really interesting to see how historians have shifted their view on the relevance or the significance of Napoleon's invasion. For many uh, scholars in the late 20th century, there was too Eurocentric to talk about Napoleon's invasion as the moment of departure for modern Arab history. And so there was an attempt to downplay the significance. I think that's a mistake. I think that this was truly uh, an event that shook the Ottoman Empire. And that was marked the beginning of a very different kind of European intervention and engagement in the Eastern Mediterranean. And I think that it was to lead to very important changes in Egypt in particular, but perhaps the most important change that was to emerge from the Napoleonic invasion of 1798 was to come after the French withdrew in 1801, creating a power vacuum that would be filled by a very dynamic governor of Cairo uh, by the name of Mehmed Ali Pasha, who would defy all the rules of gravity and would outlast any of his predecessors as governor of Egypt, a post that usually was held by powerless men for nine to 12 months with frequent changes. Suddenly you had a strong centralizer in government in Cairo who would rule until 1848, and would prove to be a conqueror of great territories, built up a very powerful army, was the first leader in the African continent to bring the technologies of the Industrial Revolution and would come to threaten the very Ottoman state itself. There was a moment there where it looked like Mehmed Ali, the governor in Egypt, would actually conquer Istanbul and the Ottoman center. So, Half century of uh, Mehmed Ali's rule being the legacy of the Napoleonic invasion is just one example of why I think we have to take Napoleon's moment very seriously. And I'm going to return to but go back to Mehmed Ali in a second, but I just want to say that it, from what I know when I, from the biography I read on Napoleon and your biography, it doesn't seem like Napoleon wanted to be bad ruler necessarily, that he wanted to suppress Egypt when he was, while it was a disaster for him eventually. He didn't want to seem to, he didn't seem to do a lot of some good as well in Egypt under his occupation. Yeah, I mean, I think that. Napoleon wasn't interested in Egypt itself. He was playing a game on a global chessboard in which he was trying to put pressure on the British presence in India by dominating the Mediterranean and Red Sea routes to India so that France would be, through its occupation of Egypt, a clear and present danger to Britain's growing uh, position in the Indian subcontinent, something France was regretful of. But um, you know, the other thing to, to remark on is that we are blessed with a wonderful chronicle of these times written by an Egyptian author who I cite extensively in my book. And I, I think that uh, El Jabarti, in, in chronicling the experience of the Egyptian encounter with the French, did exactly what I hoped for in writing my book, which is to provide modern readers in the West with what the French occupation looked like through Egyptian eyes. Mm. And I think for provoking Jabarti to write that book alone, I'm very grateful to Napoleon for his invasion. It's, it's a classic of the Arabic chronicle literature. And coming back to Mehmed Ali, um, there is another group of uh, extreme, I wouldn't call them extremists by the sound of it. They're, I'm going to try to say them right here. Uh, Wabasims, I think, to call them. Do occupy Mecca and Medina. For a while, and well, well, who were the Wabasims, and how does it come into Mehmed Ali's picture? Well, you have the emergence of an austere vision of Islamic law and society that was promoted by a man named Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, who entered into a partnership with a powerful local leader based uh, near Riyadh uh, named Muhammad ibn Saud 
And the two of them were able to bring together a kind of religio-political fusion that proved to be really quite a powerful force in a part of the Arab world that lay outside Ottoman lands. So Central Arabia, the Nejd uh, in modern Saudi Arabia, was not an area that the Ottomans had ever ruled directly. But from this stronghold, the Saudi Wahhabi Alliance was able to extend its power to the north into the southern reaches of Iraq and to the south uh, into the areas of Mecca and Medina known as the Hejaz and were able to actually occupy the holy cities, thereby preventing access to the Muslim pilgrimage coming from Damascus and from Cairo, sponsored by the Ottoman government. This was one of the most important annual religious rituals of the Ottoman Empire and an important base of legitimacy for the Sultanate. So the very fact they were not able to secure Mecca and Medina against um, local insurgency based in the Nejd was something that was very embarrassing, very compromising for the Ottoman sultans. But the Nej was very far from Istanbul. And by the 19th century... They didn't have planes back then, so they couldn't just fly over soldiers and trains even back then. It wouldn't be until Abdul Amin II that they'd get a train line. But it wasn't so you just... have to march your soldiers across land. Exactly so. There are no quick ways to get there. No steamships, mm. no planes, no railroads. You had to march troops there. So yes, that was a challenge for the Ottoman government in Istanbul. And to resolve that, they turned to their vigorous governor in Cairo, who had already been in power for eight years by the time he accepted the commission to go to Arabia and defeat the Wahhabis. And it took him seven years before he was able to complete their uh, submission and defeat them in battle. What made the Wahhabis so strong, though, that they were able to last seven years and in resistance. You've already hinted at that in terms of the difficulty of access to this terrain. And even today, when you go to war, modern armies think about the length of their supply line. And I think we can see that in, sorry for interrupting you, but I think we can see that in the Ukraine war at the moment, or sorry, special military operation, where the, where the terrible Russian logistics in the Ukraine, I think that's clear evidence for this. Absolutely. So even modern armies have to think about their supply and logistics uh, along long supply lines. Well, Mehmed Ali was running a supply line that ran from his South Sea port and, and had to go through the Red Sea coast er coastal area and into the Arabian interior. So very long supply line in very hostile territory with almost no water resources aside from isolated wells and fighting an enemy who was on their own territory and knew better than the uh, you know, invading Egyptian army. So those are very difficult circumstances to prosecute a campaign. And I think it's not surprising it took seven years. The surprising thing is after seven years, the Egyptians were able to win. And um, again, we had to to jump a little bit, uh, we forgot to add that Mehmed Ali actually would create a dynasty in Egypt, didn't he? That would last all the way, and we're coming back to this as well in the 1953, the, re the Egyptian revolution by Nasser, eventually. So you do, you do have to respect his effort and his ruling, though. I couldn't agree with you more, and I think that Mehmed Ali emerges as one of the most significant political figures in modern Arab history. When you read my book, uh, it's, it's hard to think of anyone who had his length of rule and the impact that he had. So I think he really stands out as one of the exceptional political leaders of the modern era. Now, before we move on to World War One, there is some, he does help, and we talked about the Greeks earlier, but he does help the Ottomans win the Greek independence, but he's kind of hesitant in doing so, isn't he? He, he, you're talking about Mehmed Ali being hesitant yeah. to the Ottomans with the Greek. Doesn't he, isn't he involved in the Greek, if I remember correctly, that he's involved in the Greek independence as well? You, you remember correctly. And actually, I think that for Mehmed Ali, there was an opportunity in assisting the Ottomans in the Greek war. His army first starts in Crete, which had risen up in support of the movement in the main Greek peninsula. And having conquered Crete by very violent means, 
the Egyptian um, government was able to add Crete to the territories under its rule. The Ottomans mm -hmm. conceded Crete to Egyptian rule. And then they go to the southern half of Greece, to the Peloponnesian Peninsula. And here again, the Egyptian forces were able to conquer the southern reaches of Greece. And it was called the Morea at the time. We call it the Peloponnesian Peninsula today. But this territory as well was added to Egyptian rule. So if you like, for Mehmed Ali, by supporting the Ottoman effort to suppress the Greek War of Independence, he was adding rich territories to his tax base, which was only making his government stronger and more powerful until his fleet was sunk by a combined uh, fleet of uh, Russian, British, and French warships in Navarino in 1827. And then suddenly, his troops are isolated and needed to be repatriated. He could no longer sustain a war effort if his troops were cut off from resupply because the Egyptian fleet had been sunk. But until that point, you could really say that the Greek War of Independence had been an opportunity for Mehmed Ali in being driven from Greece and losing those territories. He would begin to think in terms of acting against the Ottoman Empire, which leads to his rebuilding his army and his invasion of Syria just four years after the defeat at Navarino. And um, you do have to make a few time jumps here, but if you want to go into more details, of course, you have to actually absolutely read his book if you want to go into more details. But we have to jump until World War I, which is essential for the Egypt, Middle East, and uh, the Ottoman Empire, because this, this is, so let's talk about this World War I. And before this, though, I want to talk about, I, was, I almost forgot to mention this, that the German-Ottoman alliance, and I want to talk briefly about this, because if you know and read a little bit about the era of Ottoman history in before World War One, and you know the history there, it kind of makes sense that they will align themselves with the Ger Germans. So why did that make alliance make sense? You know, if you were thinking about what would have been in the Ottoman Empire's best interest, then preserving neutrality in World War One would have been the best solution. Hmm. But what kept the Ottomans from remaining neutral was really their fear of the Russian Empire. Mm. Because in February of 1914, even before war broke out in Europe, the Russian government had taken the decision that they would seek the first opportunity through a continental war to make a bid to claim the strategic waterways between the Black Sea, which are the Straits of the Bosphorus, the Sea of Marmara, and the Straits of the Dardanelles, as well as the Ottoman capital, Constantinople, former seat of Byzantium, as part of the Russian Empire. As you know, Catherine the Great did have a plan, and this, I believe this comes back way to her, that she wanted a new Byzantine Empire under her son. So you have deep Russian claims to these territories as part of a kind of cultural capital linked to Russia's role as protector of the Orthodox Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, but also the Russians were aware of how fragile the Ottoman Empire had become by the 1910s. In 1912, 1913, the Ottomans had fought an unsuccessful war against the successor states in the Balkans, Bulgaria, Greece, um, Serbia, Macedonia, uh, being the main territory under, under contention here, and had lost badly. Um, in the Second Balkan War, the Ottomans were able to retake the city of Adrianople or Edirne. But other than that, it was a period of territorial loss in Thrace and Macedonia. And it looked as though the Ottomans would even risk losing their capital, Istanbul. And the Russians worried that if they did not seize Istanbul or Constantinople themselves, that another country like Greece or Bulgaria would. And it was too important for Russia to allow Constantinople to fall into some other country's hands. And in February of 1914, they had taken the decision to occupy the Ottoman capital city. And the Ottomans knew this. With the outbreak of war in the summer of 1914, the Ottomans were desperate to try and conclude a defensive alliance against what they knew to be a Russian threat on their capital city. And their first choice would have been Britain or France. The British had been helping the Ottomans rebuild their navy. There was a naval mission to aid the Ottomans. 
And France had just given a $100 million loan to the Ottoman Empire to help them rebuild their economy in the aftermath of the Balkan Wars. So these are two friendly countries, very powerful states, but both were allied with Russia, and neither was willing to conclude a defensive treaty with the Ottoman Empire that might see them having to act with their ally, Russia, a part of the Triple Entente, to engage the Ottomans in hostile action. We should also add that they were really interested because of, I believe, oil would become essential at this point in time in the Middle East and wanted to carve up the Ottoman Empire as well. They were interested in its territories in the well, Middle it's East. It's a really interesting point because, in a sense, the, the first agreement struck between Britain, France, and Russia, Britain acknowledges it, it hadn't really worked out what its territorial interests in Ottoman domains were. It didn't want Russia and France to benefit at their expense, but they hadn't worked out what they wanted in Ottoman lands. I took from that that Britain, at the beginning of World War I, actually did not have colonial interests in Ottoman lands. Mm -hmm. Their policies until then had been based on the idea that the Ottoman Empire served as a valuable buffer between the Russian Empire and Western Europe. And so they'd like to preserve the integrity of the Ottoman Empire. That was more in their interest to contain Russia. And of course, since uh, I believe Elizabeth the first time, they were, their interest in the Ottoman Empire as well was keeping Russia in check that it wouldn't grow to be as well, right? So Russia turns to Britain and France at the outbreak of war and asserts its claim. It wants Constantinople, it wants the Straits, and it wants some territory in the Caucasus region. The French say, we'll agree to that, even though you're taking the richest prize. We want Syria. Hmm. And that's when Britain says, we're willing to concede to Russian wishes and French wishes without prejudice to Britain determining what territory it wishes to claim to preserve its interests. And that was the Constantinople Agreement of February, March, 1915. And that's the first of the partition agreements that will emerge from World War I. But we still haven't gotten to why Germany. And all I would say is Germany, given that Britain and France were not willing to protect the Ottomans against their known Russian threats. Germany was the natural ally because it had no colonial ambitions in the Ottoman Empire, and it was militarily very powerful. It also had a strong economy. So the view was that Germany could help protect the Ottomans against Britain and France, and crucially, to stop the Russians from moving on their ambitions to Constantinople, the Straits, and the Caucasus region. And it makes sense, right, when everyone has territorial interest and they want something from the Ottomans. It, Germany makes sense as an ally. And this wasn't where the Nazis wish would come 20 years later, but this was a normal, in quote, quotations, Germans, to put it that way. Yeah, it wasn't the genocidal Germans of the Nazi regime, that's for sure. And um, But if you like, the... Um, The reason why the Ottomans were interested in an alliance is is obvious. They also thought Germany was going to win the war very quickly. Mm. And German advances in the opening weeks of the war gave the Ottomans every reason to hope that they could ally with Germany and then benefit after German victory, perhaps to secure some territories they had recently lost, islands in the Aegean, territories in the Caucasus that Russia had claimed. They could hopefully win some things back but they hadn't really counted on getting drawn into the war themselves just because their army was still very weak after the experience of the Balkan Wars. And there was a naval mission and a German military mission then actively trying to rebuild the broken power of the Ottoman army. So they weren't ready for war. They hoped they wouldn't have to make war, but for the Germans, they could see where possibly the Ottomans gave them a secret weapon that they could deploy against Britain and France and Russia. And that, of course, is the weapon of jihad. So let's talk about World War I and the weapon of jihad. So how does it go for the Ottomans? And this is an episode in itself that we go to cover eventually in in a more detail, but let's just talk about World War I and the weapon of jihad, like we said. Well, for the Germans, they could see the weakness of the Ottoman army. They, they knew that they could help reinforce the Ottomans, but 
their expectations of the Ottomans making a meaningful contribution on the battlefield were limited. What they believed the Ottomans could do is they could play on the title of caliph, which we were talking about at the time of the Ottoman conquest of the Mamluk Empire. The fact that the Sultan was not just the ruler of the Ottoman Empire, but had authority over Sunni Islam's uh, believers around the world, meant that they saw the authority of the Caliph Sultan as being able to work on the loyalties of colonial Muslims in British India, in French North Africa, and in the Russian Caucasus. They hoped that the Sultan, by declaring a jihad in World War I, might be able to engage colonial Muslims to challenge the, Britain, the British in India and force the British to try and put down a colonial uprising in India that would weaken their forces in the European front. They hoped the same in French North Africa and West Africa, largely Muslim majority societies. If you were to see major uprisings in Algeria or Senegal, this would have really weakened the French war effort if they'd had to send soldiers to try and put down a colonial war in North Africa or West Africa. And of course, the Russian Empire had conquered deep into the Caucasus Muslim territories in places like Circassia, in, uh, in Chechnya, that the Ottomans hoped would rise up to a call for jihad. So in this way, the Germans thought they could use an alliance with the Ottomans to wear down the Entente through their colonial possessions. 180 million Muslims worldwide under colonial rule of those three powers. They had reason to believe this could be a game changer for World War I. But of course, the jihad doesn't go as well as planned, because it's kind of, I would say, a little outdated at this time, right? Well, I, I think that for the Germans, it was almost an Orientalist dream. There was this sort of notion that Muslims were irrational people who could be driven to pick up you know, guns and swords on a command of a, an Ottoman ruler thousands of miles from where they lived. And of course, Muslims are no less rational than the rest of us. Their concerns are very much about the provision of daily life. And They're human pe pe beings like we are. I was going to say, so no more likely to behave you know, fanatically than you and, and, and they didn't. But it's interesting because it nonetheless worried the British in particular. You'll see British war planners really being drawn deeper and deeper into a front they did not think was central to the war hmm. in the Middle East, largely to try and contain the threat of jihad. And of course, hmm. you know, there are two things that emerged from reading about the Ottomans in World War I. First, contrary to German expectations, the Ottomans fought a very good war. And they were able to defeat the British and the French in Gallipoli. Hmm. They defeated them in Mesopotamia. And they defeated them twice in Palestine in the first and second battles of Gaza. So these are really important military victories that the Turkish army was able to achieve, much to the surprise of the German allies. And secondly, the jihad worked more on the minds of German war planners than on colonial Muslims. Hmm. And in that, I think, there was a surprise for everyone. Hmm. So let's talk about after World War One, and I, I discussed this with some friends of mine as well. That if I don't I know, historians kind of hate uh, what if questions, but I, I kind of have to ask this, and I feel like it's relevant because I talk, like I said, I'm talking about some friends of mine where we talked about what if the car rub of the Middle East never happened, and they argued that it probably wouldn't look much different than what we see today. Do you agree that it? Would it look much different than it is today, or would it look more or less the same? Just a few different border disputes. It's a very but maybe not disputes, yeah. but border changes. It's a very interesting counterfactual. the The one thing that we could say would be very different is that there would not have been a successful Zionist colonization of Palestine, mm. because the Ottomans had discouraged that already in the 19th century, and would not have been likely to have encouraged it in the 20th given their aversion to nationalism and the way nationalism could fragment the territory in their control, they would have been very unsympathetic to the Zionist movement and wouldn't have had a motive the way the British did to try and encourage Zionist settlement in Palestine. So that's a very 
important part of 20th century Middle Eastern history. For the rest, it's hard to know whether the cultural uh, and uh, autonomy movements that were emerging in the Arab territories at the beginning of the 20th century would have developed towards fully developed nationalist movements, as you saw in the Balkans in the 19th century, or whether the Ottomans would have found means to continue to renegotiate the relationship between the Turkish peoples and the Arab peoples, and for completeness, the Kurdish peoples. You know, if you think about it, the Ottoman Empire by 1914 really had gotten distilled down to a territory in which the majority population was Muslim and where the dominant ethnicities were Turkish, Kurdish, and Arab. You know, that could actually have been a stable empire. You think it would have lasted longer, perhaps? It certainly could have lasted longer. I think the clincher in that counterfactual would have been who would have controlled the oil resources. Mm. Because if Istanbul had become a redistributive center of the wealth of oil, it might have been enough to hold that Ottoman structure together. But if you'd had Kurds coming to dominate oil and that fueling their drive for a separate identity based on their separate culture, which would be imaginable in the 20th century and the growth of nationalism, then it might have broken things up. It would have looked different no matter what we say. It would not have had uh, a Syria separated from a Lebanon. It would not have had a Transjordan separated from uh, you know, Hejaz. Um, hard to see how Iraq would have emerged as you know, a country within the frontiers we associate today. Probably the Kurds would have achieved statehood uh, in a way they've been denied right through to the 21st century. I think things would have been quite different, to be honest. You think it would have been better, perhaps? I mean, I think the roots of conflict uh, lay in any place where you have unresolved national aspirations. Mm. And so who knows how violent the conflicts of uh, a 20th century Ottoman Empire as it tried to hold together or as it forced forces trying to break it apart might have gone. But certainly we would not have seen such violence as the you know, three, four major Arab-Israeli wars. Um, and, and hopefully we would not have seen the kind of mass expulsions of populations that would have characterized the 20th century. So of course, let's talk about the carve-up of the Middle East, which is a huge part of the book and then they get several chapters to this, but we don't, we don't have time to go through it in as much detail as you do, but let's talk about the carve-up and the colonial rule in the Middle East, which is not too great, is it? Well, it's all about domination, and domination will invariably produce resistance. The colonial Middle East was created by the European powers in line with... And they did, we should add that they did draw up this before World War I was finished too, that, that this, they agreed to this before they were even sure they would win World War I, I believe. No, it's true. And so if they'd lost the war, none of those partition agreements would ever have been implemented. But, uh, and it wasn't obvious that Britain and France would win the war. So, you know, the contingency of those plans is something we have to bear in mind. But I think to me, the original sin behind this carve up of Asian territory by white Europeans who had for generations believed it completely natural and normal for white Europeans to carve up Asian territories. As, as a joke, Joe, it's free real estate, basically. Yes, well, precisely but without trying to get the consent of the people involved. No dialogue, no persuasion, only coercion. And this clumsy approach to trying to dominate people who are increasingly well-educated, increasingly influenced by the developments taking place around them in the rest of the world. You know, the thought that you would be able to continue 19th century colonial methods in the times of 20th century mass communications was simply not realistic. And so the 1920s and 1930s are a period of Britain and France finding their colonies ever more difficult to rule, ever more expensive on their governments, as the ideas of separation and nationalism and independence grow stronger and stronger 
and spell the inevitability of decolonization, which will come in the aftermath of Britain and France's terrible experiences in the Second World War. And if you know a little bit about colonial history, you know the British and and the French were great, were known to oppress the colonial subjects. They certainly tried in a bid to preserve these increasingly untenable colonial realities. So the idea that you would try and find collaborators within colonial society to assist you in managing these territories in a way that meant that they aren't such a terrible drain on your taxpayers' money and on your treasury was the challenge that both Britain and France, fa Britain and France faced in the interwar years. Hmm. So let's talk about, and again, we, we don't have time to talk to, go as much in detail on this, but let's talk about the fight for independence, because that comes eventually as well. Well, as I was saying, you know, Britain and France were in an increasingly untenable position, and I think the Second World War was to really lead to a collapse of their power beyond their own frontiers. France certainly was weakened in the Second World War by its occupation by Nazi Germany and the creation of the collaborationist Vichy government. The conflict between Free French and Vichy French over control of colonial territories had created all sorts of problems for their continuity. And looking just at the Middle East, Syria and Lebanon had already emerged with aspirations for independence. By 1943, when the Free French displaced the Vichy French in those territories with British assistance, they are only able to secure their very tenuous hold by promising that independence would come. And Britain acted as guarantor mm -hmm of the independence of Syria and Lebanon. So the formula was there, if you like, for independence. It was only after the war when de Gaulle and the, the French government tried to slow the drive towards independence that they found one last round of resistance from the Syrians and Lebanese before they were able to finally secure their independence. And Syria and Lebanon would go to San Francisco to become uh, signatories of the UN Charter, original members on an equal footing with France. So in that sense, asserting their sovereignty as equals with France, the end of the colonial situation. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't work so smoothly as that. And coming out of the colonial situation, achieving a strong and uh, independent state would prove a challenge for all the countries uh, in the post-Second World War era and if you like, the greatest challenge was going to come from one of the most enduring colonial legacies, which is going to be the Zionist movement in Palestine and the Palestine War in 1948, the first major challenge to the newly independent Arab states, a challenge they failed in terribly. And something we should add as well, and again, if you know a little bit about, about colonial history and decolonization, the British and the French were basically, okay, fine, you're on your own. We, you don't want us here, we just got to go and you're, it's up to you yourself. They didn't stay, they didn't teach them they didn't try to teach them how to be, have a good democracy or try to be a decent, have a decent ru rule of their su su subjects. They just kind of, okay, we're gonna fuck off, we're gonna leave, and you're on your own. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's, it's a good point, but I think we have to acknowledge that there was a limit to how much tutoring the Syrians, Lebanese, Palestinians, Jordanians, Iraqis would accept. They were at that point convinced that they had the institutions to rule themselves. They had parliaments, they had presidencies, they had justices, they had constitutions. They felt they had all the instruments and they really were no longer interested in the advice of Britain and France. I mean, it's understandable again. I think it's totally understandable. that They had not wanted to be colonized in the first place and they spent the 1920s and 1930s often in periods of insurrection, in which they faced very violent suppression, Iraq in 1920, Syria 1925 to 27. You know, they, these were, and all the experiences of Palestine, of being suppressed in their bids to try and stop Zionist immigration and resist the British mandate, were met with terrible violence. And this had soured relations between the Arab peoples and the colonial powers, so by the 1940s, they didn't think that the colonial powers had anything left to offer them. They wanted them gone. They wanted them out. And 
you mentioned this earlier, and Egypt is so, in this time a big, again, a big part of your book, as as we will see. But it's so, something that we had mentioned is that the sorry the Mehmed Ali dynasty. And before we go to the Egyptian in the independence, I want to ask. What, what, because we did mention that they would rule up until 1953 when Nasser became president of, of Egypt. So what, what allowed them to rule during the colonial dynasty? Or what let them stay on, on the throne, for lack of a better word, during colonialism? Yeah, it's a good question, because you could almost argue that by the 1880s, the family of Mehmed Ali was at risk of collapse. You, you had a major uprising in 1881-82, which brings about the British occupation. And the British occupy Egypt to reimpose the Mehmed Ali family as the ruling dynasty, and then find themselves as occupiers of Egypt to prop up this weakened government and would stay in Egypt then until, you know, 1954 is when they conclude an agreement after the revolution. And effective a withdrawal that is completed in March of 1956. Were, were they more puppets, in other words? The British saw Egypt as a crucial territory in their imperial network because, of course, the Suez Canal mm. transited Egyptian territory and provided the shortest route from Britain to India through the Mediterranean and the Red Sea. And this created a sense of strategic importance over Egypt that made Britain an unwilling occupier, if we're honest, in 1882, into a colonial ruler, unwilling, uh, increasingly unwilling to relinquish Egypt as we get into the 20th century. The importance of Egypt to Britain's first World War effort was obvious. This was the point of transit for soldiers from New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, uh, India, and you know, provided a, a training ground as well as a supply depot for all of their forces working in the Eastern Mediterranean. So right there, they could see where Egypt had played a crucial role in upholding the empire in World War I. And it played a crucial role in World War II and the battles in the Western desert against the German panzers uh, led by General Erwin Rommel, you know, were, are one of the more famous battles of the Second World War if, for Britain. And um, so they saw Egypt as a vitally strategic territory in a global empire. But of course, in the post-Second World War era, the collapse of Britain's extraterritorial presence, independence in India in 1947, you know, the, the, this, the replacement of uh, the dominions with the Commonwealth after the Second World mm. War. Um, Suddenly, you know, what is Egypt? It's an it's a, a independent-minded country that's straddling a canal, which is now the vital strategic waterway to nowhere for Britain. It doesn't have an empire out there anymore. And so there was need for a rethink here. And I think this is what colors Britain's diminishing influence in Egypt and the growing assertiveness of Egyptian officers in demanding total independence from all British control and the exit of all British troops, all foreign troops from Egypt territory. And before we move on to Nasser, and sorry for teasing you a little bit here, but I want to talk about the creation at this time, Saudi Arabia. So how does that come about? Well, it's really interesting because people will talk about the wartime partition plans and Britain's promises to the Hashemites to establish an Arab kingdom. And then of course, that Arab kingdom never happens Britain and France divide up the Arab provinces among themselves and leave just the Hejaz to the Hashemites. But it overlooks the fact that there was already an Arab kingdom project that had already started at the beginning of the 20th century and by the 1920s and 30s had grown to cover, again, I'm estimating, but about 80% of the Arabian Peninsula from the Nejd, extending in the 1910s to the Persian Gulf with the conquest of of the Eastern province, or in Hassa, and then with the extension into the Hejaz in the 1920s, when they conquer that Red Sea province from its Hashemite rulers and add that to their territory. And suddenly the Arabian Peninsula from the Persian Gulf to the Red Sea is under one ruler based in 
Riyadh, who gives his family name to that of his country, uh, and it becomes the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And, and with that, you have a very large territory under central rule uh, of a, a secular ruler with a very strong religious support base. And they now enjoy the legitimacy and the revenues that come with protection of the uh, holy cities of the Muslim pilgrimage, Mecca and Medina. The revenues, of course, being all the trade that comes along with the annual pilgrimage to Mecca. And how lucky were they that were sitting on basically a handful of oil in, at the same time? Which they wouldn't know about until really the late 1930s, early 1940s, before you have your first major strike in the Damam Dome, which would, of course, be the great game changer. But it's quite interesting because one reason why Britain never sought to extend its um, influence or control over Saudi territory was they didn't believe that there was oil in Saudi territory. It would have looked quite different, I believe, if they knew. It would have been quite different. And they had left Saudi Arabia to uh, an American consortium of companies for oil exploration. This is really going to be you know, the basis of a deepening American engagement with the Persian Gulf region. They, they were there already with the red line agreements uh, in the partition of uh, Iraqi and Kuwaiti oil. But when it came to Saudi oil, that was going to be predominantly American exploration. And it was really going to be, you know, the basis of a very strong American interest in the Persian Gulf that endures down to our day today. And of course, we had to go back to Egypt and talk about the Sir, because he's someone I've been looking forward to talking about, because he's a brilliant ruler, if you ask me. And how does he come to power? We're talking about Kamal Abdel Nasser. Yeah, Nasser, yes. So really, Nasser's rise to power is through the growing discontent of Egyptian officers in the post-Second World War era. And their discontent is based firstly on the corruption of the monarchy in Egypt and its failure to really assert total sovereignty by forcing the British to withdraw. The Nationalist Party, known as the Weft, was re-elected to parliament after the Second World War. Their whole purpose as a political party was to secure Egypt's total independence. They've been calling for this since 1919, 1920. And still in 1945, 1946, they're calling for it and haven't achieved it. Britain is still dominating Egypt. So that's one source of growing discontent. Egyptian officers feel very humiliated by the British control over their country. The fact that they are subordinate to British commanders in their own country. This is unacceptable to army officers who are very patriotic, very nationalistic. And then the second serious discontent of the Egyptian officers will come in the conduct of the 1948 Palestine War, when the Egyptian army enters without much preparation, underestimating their Zionist enemy, believing they would have a quick victory. They actually find themselves quickly bogged down in a very dangerous war against a determined and well-armed enemy who showed a discipline in defending territory that left the Egyptians soon encircled in a borderlands between the Sinai and southern Palestine, soon to be southern Israel. And actually, from the moment the Egyptians enter, it is already Israel, a territory that Israel, that the Israeli forces are trying to conquer away from what had been allotted to an Arab state in the UN partition resolution. And encircled around the area of Fallujah, Nasser and his fellow officers are besieged by Israelis and have time to think while they're not fighting. And their thoughts are very much on the failure of their government that had left the proud Egyptian army in such a weak position and unable to save Palestine from the Zionist movement. And when they come back after the armistice is signed and are repatriated to Egypt, the shaken and humiliated Egyptian army doesn't blame itself, it blames the government and it blames the monarchy. And they begin to plan for a change in government to allow new rulers to provide for the strength of Egypt. And they're not the only plotters. You have a strong communist party, maybe not that strong, but a, an ideologically engaged communist party. You have the Muslim Brotherhood, 
you have lots of different factions in an Egypt in 1948, 49, who were inflamed with nationalist fervor, infuriated, infuriated by defeat and talking about uh, overthrowing the government. Hmm. But it would be the officers who would act first when in July of 1952, they pull off a near bloodless coup that forces the King Farouk to step down as monarch. But tellingly, though Nasser and his younger colleagues were at the heart of this free officer revolution, they didn't lead it themselves. And Nasser wasn't actually the first president of Egypt or the first prime minister. They, they left that honor to an older brigadier general named Mohammed Naguib. And he's going to be, if you like, the leader, the figurehead leader of the free officers who's trying to contain very um, rebellious uh, and, and impatient uh, juniors, men like Abdul Nasser. Um, and interestingly as well, the army officers with no experience of, military, of, of uh, political action don't take control of the government at first. They, they didn't know how to. And they leave in place the monarchy. The king has stepped down, but they don't abolish the monarchy yet. They actually create a regency and declare the king's infant son the kind of prince regent. And there's a regency council to oversee the running of the monarchy. And they invite an experienced veteran uh, named Ali Maher to form the cabinet to rule Egypt with the army standing as a sort of guardianship council. And it would only be after nine or 10 months that the army officers feel strong enough that when they meet resistance from Ali Maher and his government, they then topple them. Nagy becomes the prime minister, and then they abolish the monarchy and declare the republic. And it won't be until 1954 that the rivalry between Nasser and Nagy leads Nasser to overturn the very popular uh, President Nagy and make himself president instead. So there's a, a long road to dominating Egypt for Nasser, but by 1954, he is the unquestioned, unrivaled ruler of Egypt. He would stay so until his death in September of 1970. And Midrana uh, Chief, following the structure of the book, and Midrana Chief going back to Egypt as well, because it's an important factor. But something you mentioned as well is the creation of Israel. And we talked about this brief briefly before we recorded, that it does not come very lightly in your book, does and we have to talk about the creation between Israel and the Palestine conflict because it's also essential in here. So let's talk about this first. Well, I think many friends of Israel have read my book and been uncomfortable by parts of the analysis, but I remind them that my book was written to try and portray for Western readers the Arab experience of modern history. And if you're looking for a sympathetic Arab experience vis a vis Israel, you're not likely to find one for that period. The Arabs experienced defeat at the hands of Israel in the 1948 Palestine War. Egypt was uh, invaded by Israel in 1956 in partnership with Britain and France, which for Egypt was you know, a, a source of like a triple betrayal uh, that, that Britain, France would collude with Israel against Egypt was the kind of Zionist imperial plot of conspiracy theories. It was hard to believe that it was a real collusion. The Arab world kind of sort of united on this, that they would not recognize Israel at all. Well, again, you know, increasingly Israel would occupy Arab territory. This would be, you know, what they gained in invading the Sinai Peninsula in 1956. Israel was forced to relinquish under American and UN pressure. But in 1967, they'd win it all back again fully occupy not just the West Bank and Gaza Strip, the last territories of the Palestine mandate that had until then remained outside Israel, but also all of the Sinai Peninsula and all of the Golan Heights. So this meant that Israel's neighbors, Syria, Jordan, Egypt, and the Palestinian territories were all left with grievances, territorial losses that they wanted resolved before they'd be willing to engage with Israel. And in a sense, from 1967 down to the present day, there's been a zero sum game played over territory in a rule of exchanging land for peace that is increasingly being abandoned with the so-called Abraham Accords leading to 
normalization of relations between Arab states and Israel without the relinquishing of territory and the resolution of Israeli-Palestinian differences. So even those rules now seem to be under question as we move in the 21st century. And speaking of the 21st century, as we mentioned, nobody, uh, uh, unless maybe Egypt would later recognize, maybe not recognize completely, but they would have a peace and we talk it back to the six states for in a second. But how many countries in the Arab world today, is there any at all who recognizes Egypt as of this recording 2022? Who recognize Israel? Mm. Well, you have full peace treaties between Egypt and Israel since 1981. And that is total recognition. There's, there's, there's no greater level of recognition. The only thing you can say about the Egyptian-Israeli peace that is negative, of course, is that it was concluded by the governments without necessarily popular support. And I think a lot of people in Egypt remain very uncomfortable with the normalization of relations with Israel, which is why the Israelis refer to a cold peace in Egypt. Hmm. The second full peace treaty between Egypt and an Arab state is with Jordan. And that was concluded in 1993 in the aftermath of the Oslo Accords between Israel and the Palestinian Authority and, or the PLO at that point. And you know we can talk there about total peace, but now you've had a full normalization or a promise of full normalization concluded between Sudan, Morocco, the United Arab Emirates, and Bahrain. And in some of these countries, you've already had the exchange of ambassadors. You have the establishment of regular air links with national airlines flying between the Emirates and Israel, Bahrain and Israel. And um, I'm not entirely sure if all of them exchanged ambassadors, or in some cases, I think Sudan and Morocco, it's still in discussion. But the, the plan, the, the commitment to full recognition and normalization is there. So there is a growing mass of Arab states who recognize the reality of Israel's enduring presence as a sovereign state. They're very keen to see Israel recognize Palestinian aspirations for statehood. They you know, would like to keep pressuring the Israelis to resolve the conflict with the Palestinians, but they are now at peace with Israel and are conducting business increasingly with Israel uh, on a normalized basis. We do have a few more topics to have to discuss, which is, which is again essential in your book as well, and which is the Six Days War between Egypt and Israel. So who, how does this Six Day War start? No, the only thing I have to say is I'm going to have to end within the next five minutes because of yeah. my appointment. So yeah, of course. Is this where you want to end it? Uh, we could end it here. Yeah, I, I'm sorry for not uh, going through everything I wish we could discuss. And there's so much more I do I want to discuss. And again, if uh, there is a few things we ha haven't talked about, I wish you absolutely should read in the book if you want to go in more detail. Thank you so much for coming on. I'm sorry we don't have time to discuss everything here and jumping out of the podcast. But before you go, where can people buy your, buy your book? I wish you absolutely should again. And do you have anything you wish to promote on your social media where people might find you? You know, I'm not on Facebook or Twitter, so I don't have any particular place to direct anyone. But uh, good reading, everyone. And thank you so much for this opportunity to talk to your audience about my recent books. Thank you so much for coming on. This has been World Up H12. We are available on social media on Instagram and World Up H12. You can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, wherever you can find podcasts these days. Please consider like, share, and subscribe. And if you are on Apple Podcasts, write a little review. That would help us out a lot. This has been World Up H12, and I'll see you next time.